In this lesson, we're going to explore a more complex approach to skin shading in cycles using the Arnold Port shader network that was built by Matthew Heimlich, who um, has done a few Blender Cookie tutorials for us. But uh, he built it based on the Arnold skin shader, um, which is a render engine that's developed by Solid Angle. And now I believe it's proprietary to Sony Pictures Imageworks. Um, and it's being used on all their modern films like the Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs films, as well as uh, the Amazing Spider-Man reboot. So it's a very new engine that's garnered a lot of respect in the uh, modern industry. And uh, anyway, Matthew Heimlich knows uh, personally one of the developers who um, kind of helped him work out this shader node that mimics the math and internal workings of the Arnold skin material. And uh, if you come from other high-end render engines like Mental Ray or V-Ray that uses standard uh, tri-layer subsurface scattering for skin, then uh, this shader network will be more familiar to you than simply the subsurface scattering uh, cycles node. So um, anyway, uh, I've included this material with the source files and we will need to append that into our scene. So let's go to File, Append, and uh, let's uh, go find the file. It's called arnoldskin.blend. If we click that, then go to the Material folder, you'll see it in there, Skin Complex. And now if we go find that material to apply it to our head, you will see this mishmash of settings in this gigantic node. And uh, if you don't have any experience with the previously mentioned tri-layer skin materials, then this is going to look crazy to you. But um, if you do have experience with them, then uh, you should recognize a lot of the settings here uh, where we have diffuse color, we have shallow, mid, and deep subsurface scattering layers. We have primary gloss and secondary gloss. Um, if you're an experienced artist, then you should know exactly what to do with all these settings. And it gives you all that detailed control that you're used to. So uh, let's dive in and enable viewport rendering over here in my small um, rendering viewport. And uh, first thing we'll see is, uh, at least with this scene and with this, the scale of this head, we'll see that the scale, uh, the default of 0.85 is a little bit too high. So let's bump that down to point two, let's say, okay, what about point one? Um, well, truthfully, it's really hard to tell what's the right scale and how, how to dial that in, partly because our skin looks extremely blown out, like our light is just 10 times the power that it needs to be. However, this is the same lighting from the previous lesson, which I know um, had good values. And if we zoom in here and look at the eyes, you'll notice that they are not blown out. So this tells me that it has something to do with the shader. And um, there could be a couple things wrong with it. Uh, number one, I want to take a look at the diffuse weight versus the subsurface scattering weight. Okay, because uh, the shader comes with a set of default settings, um, including what the shallow, mid, and deep uh, colors are, what their scatter radiuses are. You can see here that they're all different as well as um, default specularity settings. So um, in order to dial this in, I really need to go one by one. So I will turn off uh, my specular weights down here, primary glossy, let's turn that to zero, uh, secondary glossy, turn that to zero as well, and then go all the way back up here to diffuse weight versus subsurface weight. So let's start by turning off my subsurface weight and uh, you'll see there that we lose our overblown um, lighting. Um, so what if we do the opposite? Let's turn off diffuse and enable um, subsurface. And uh, while it is still overblown a little bit, it's not nearly as bad as when the diffuse was combined with the subsurface. So um, what I'm going to assume from this is that diffuse and, and overall subsurface weight, they both should not be one. So what if we go 0.5 and 0.5? This certainly seems to work out a lot better. Uh, but at the forehead specifically, it still seems a little bit overblown. And I think part of that is the diffuse color, which is, you know, 0.8, almost white. So if we take that down to, you know, 0.5, um, this starts to look a lot better and it's not quite so overblown. 
Um, but why do we even have a diffuse setting here? Because in the simplistic version of the shader, I only used a subsurface node. There was no diffuse element at all. And if you read the documentation that Matthew provided on the Blender Artist thread, he recommends that the diffuse color is for the overall head uh, color texture. So let's, let's add that. Um, Shift A, texture, image texture, and also we need a texture coordinate node. Let's plug in the UVs to the vector and go grab that map. Here we are, head color. And we'll plug that into our diffuse color swatch. And we can start to see a little bit of that flesh tone come through. If we zoom in here on the eyebrow. Specifically, I'm looking here because remember my eyebrow um, was included in the texture from when I photo sourced uh, from a person's face. So there is an eyebrow texture um, mapped to the eyebrow, but we can barely see it. And this is partly due to our diffuse weight is at 0.5. So we come to a bit of a problem here where um, if I have this at one, we'll see the full value of the texture. But if we have it at one, it's overblown and we can't really use those values. So if you ask me, I don't really see a lot of reason to use the diffuse weight, especially with the color map um, in my personal experience, because um, you know, this is a subsurface skin shader. And as soon as I start to add diffuse weight, I'm simply removing the uh, attributes of subsurface scattering. So I personally don't see a place for a diffuse map when trying to achieve the look of skin. Where I will use it is, let's say um, I wanted to have dirt on the character's skin. Dirt doesn't have subsurface attributes, so that would be perfect um, to add a dirt map and plug it into the diffuse color. But uh, I don't think that this head uh, texture map contributes to the subsurface characteristics that we're going for. So I'm going to disconnect that map and turn our diffuse weight to zero. I'm only going to use subsurface scattering weight. So I'm going to bump that up to one and it's going to overblow a little bit. Um, but this leads me into um, another kind of rule of thumb when it comes to this tri-layer type of skin shading. And if we look down here at our subsurface weights, we have the shallow weight at 0.5, the mid weight at 0.5, and then the deep weight at 1. But the thing is, each of these three layers needs to combine to create one unified um, skin quality. But right now we have 1 plus 0.5 plus 0.5, which gives us a value of 2. So a common rule of thumb with these tri-layer materials is to keep the um, weights of each subsurface layer when they're added together to equal 1. So let's do that now with um, deep subsurface weight. Let's go to, um, let's say, 0.2 there, which leaves 0.8 total to split between shallow and mid. So let's change that to 0.4 and 0.4. Now they combine to equal one. And hopefully you can see over here in the preview render that we're getting less and less blown out and our values are starting to make a little bit more sense. Something else to keep in mind though is uh, way down at the bottom, we have this setting called use screen mode. And uh, if we turn that off, you'll notice that um, our shader gets a little bit more blown out. And this is because um, by default, or I guess with this turned off, um, our subsurface layers are being added together uh, the same way as when you add a shader add shader node compared to a mix shader node. Uh, typically mix shader is more physically correct and add shader is not physically correct. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because that can result in overblown subsurface values. However, if we change this to one, each layer is no longer being added, but instead being screened. So that kind of um, clamps it at a one value, if you will. And at this point, we should be able to dial in our scale value um, a little bit easier. So let's change that from 0.2. Let's go to, let's say, 0.1. I think that looks pretty good. Um, but uh, now let's address the colors of our um, subsurface layers, namely the top two. So with this image texture that I've already used, I'm going to um, replace the image with uh, this map called SSS Epid, which stands for epidermal, the highest layer of skin. And uh, we'll click on that and you'll notice that if we, well, 
let's see it by itself. Input, no, not input, shader emission. You can see that it is um, more of a purple tone. It's, it's supposed to be desaturated, but I took it even into the purple direction, which um, reflects what's happening in the default color of the shallow SSS swatch. If we click on that, um, it's basically white, but it is creeping towards the purple spectrum. So um, my map and whatever map you create should be a similar color. Um, so let's plug that into the shallow SSS color swatch and see what that does for our shader, which uh, it made it orange. So that's a little odd. How about we go ahead and add the mid uh, color texture, shift control D to duplicate the image texture node and maintain its previous connections and then go find my um, sub D map, which stands for subdermal. And uh, as you can tell with this one, let's look at it by itself. It's a very saturated orangish red color, which doesn't reflect exactly what's happening over here in the mid SSS color swatch by default. But um, let's plug it in to see how it um, reacts with the other one. And when they're combined together, you know, it's in the right direction, but um, it's definitely too reddish orange and uh, too saturated in general for the skin. It looks like he's been baking in a um, tanning booth for way too long. So what we can do here is um, manually manipulate each of these color maps as we want to. But uh, first, let's just try adjusting the weights of these um, subsurface layers. So. Let's change the shallow. Let's give it a little bit more influence. Let's go to 0 0.6 and then decrease the mid weight to 0 0.2. See what that does for us. Okay, so that's giving us a little bit more purple and kind of desaturating the overall skin. I think it still could use a little bit of manual tweaking. So we'll do that with a color hue saturation node. And for this top one, Let's uh, decrease the saturation from point, I'm sorry, from one to 0.6, and then uh, increase the value to 1.5. Okay, and then duplicate this node and plug it in to um, our uh, mid-level texture map. Though, um, let's keep the saturation at one and simply increase the value, or actually keep the value at 1.5. Hmm, he still looks a little bit too saturated. Let's continue going down in saturation on both um, maps. Then um, how about we readjust the weights. Shallow, let's take it down to 0.5 and then mid weight up to 0.3. Yeah, I think that looks a little bit more natural. Um, let's see, as far as deep SSS color goes, you certainly can paint a map for it. But um, since we have it all the way down at 0.2, it's not contributing a ton to the overall subsurface look. So I'm just going to leave it at the default red color. And this is the deepest color, obviously based on the label of the setting. So typically this is a dark red color. And I'm going to leave it as is. Keep in mind that for each of these um, SSS layers, you have um, radiuses that you can control. This is what gives you very, very fine control over exactly what the subsurface is doing. So um, they have default set up. I'm just going to leave them there uh, for the sake of time. But uh, it is very nice that we have that amount of control. Uh, let's move on to the specular settings down here. And uh, in order to start tweaking those, I'm going to simply turn off my uh, subsurface weight. I'll go down to zero and uh, re-enable. Um, my primary glossy weight first. Let's make that 0.6, which I think is the default. And um, here we have reflections, but as far as the reflection color, um, supporting what I said in the first lesson is the specular color for skin tends to be in the blue direction, which is true here. We can, of course, plug in a texture map here, which I will do the same way I did in the first lesson. So let's go grab that map specular down here and uh, okay so if we just plug this into the primary gloss color we'll lose that blue value so let's um, hover over this color control C to copy it and then add a color mix RGB node and paste that color into both swatches 
Now for this upper swatch, I'm going to decrease the value a little bit, keeping it the same color, but um, dragging its value down, which will break up the monotony of the surface. Let's plug the um, color of our image texture into the factor. And just to show you exactly what this is doing, I'll plug it into the emission. So you can see here that around the eyebrows and the beard and just the general darker areas, we won't get as much specular reflection. So now this can go into the primary gloss color. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, you can start to see that breakup happening. But if we want to see more, we just simply decrease the value. There we go. Now we're really starting to see how the map is affecting that specular color. And I'll be happy with that. Now for the other gloss settings, we have a primary gloss bump where we can uh, plug in a specific bump map for this glossy layer. We can also do a different map for the secondary gloss bump. And we can also put in a specific diffuse color bump map. You know, which again, going back to the dirt on the face, that could benefit from having a different bump map from the rest of the skin. But in this case, since it's a, it's a clean face, uh, we can simply do what we did with the simplistic shader and uh, duplicate an image texture node, go grab our bump map and plug this into the displacement. So this is the same as the last lesson. I don't really have a need for multiple unique bump maps um, in this case but uh, I do need to add a converter math node, change the operation to multiply and the value, let's go to 0.1. We, we need it to be um, nowhere near as strong as it just was. Perhaps a little bit more, let's go to 0.2. See how that's showing up. Maybe even a little bit more than that. Let's go to 0.4. There we go. I think that that's looking pretty good. Um, Okay, back to the specular settings, or rather the primary gloss settings. Below the bump map, we have primary gloss roughness, and this works just like it does in the glossy. If we go down, he will uh, get shinier, and potentially you could see this as being more sweaty, but um, I like a value of 0.2 for this one. And now for the primary Fresnel coefficient, this is where we dial in our Fresnel characteristic. So let's just test what it looks like at point one. Uh, you can see here that the reflection on the surface that's facing more directly to the camera, that nearly goes away entirely. Whereas if we take the coefficient up to point nine, um, all of the head starts to reflect a little bit more. So let's plug this into, how about point five? Yeah, I mean, that's right in the middle. So I think that that's a, a fairly good value to work with. And that's it for the primary gloss settings. Then we move on to the secondary gloss settings, which are identical to the primary, but the secondary gloss does look a little bit different from the primary. Um, I mean, as you would expect, why else would you have two gloss settings? So um, let's remember our primary gloss weight at 0.6 and then turn it off so we can uh, concentrate solely on the secondary gloss. Let's bump that weight up to 0.5. And uh, what you'll notice about this one is the roughness is much higher. And this kind of gives it a, a velvety kind of look. So in my opinion, the secondary gloss might not even be necessary. But if I was to justify it, I would say that um, it represents the very fine hairs that grow all over a person's face. I think that's sort of the point of the secondary gloss. So um, I'm going to go ahead and keep the settings as is, perhaps take down some of the um, Fresnel coefficient. Let's go down to 0.2. Yeah, let's just do that. Um, it's not going to contribute a whole lot, but um, it can give that effect of the uh, fuzziness of someone's face. So now that we have each individual gloss component dialed in, let's try to combine them. We'll take a primary up to 0.6, which is where I had it. And uh, secondary, let's take that down to, let's say 0.3. Yeah, I think that'll work nice. And now when we bring back our um, subsurface weight, let's bump that up to one. And at this point, we've addressed everything in the shader. So let's start to do some comparisons uh, to the simplistic skin shader as far as render time and look. 
Um, let's look at our render settings, 800 by 800, 50%, and uh, render at 1,000, or samples at 1,000. Um, let's see what that looks like. Okay, that's not looking too bad. Uh, off the top of my head, perhaps I would decrease the scale of the subsurface a little bit. Um, it's shining through the ears, I think, perhaps a bit too much. I could, of course, plug in the scale texture map that I used in the first lesson the exact same way. Um, but uh, also, I'd like to increase the specularity. Uh, there's just not enough, in my opinion. But um, as far as render time, we're at 3 minutes and 26 seconds. So let's switch to slot 4 and then apply the simple material, which I may need to append. I do. So let's add a fake user to the skin complex material and then append my simple material from the previous scene file that I recorded with. Here we go. Now let's render this. And I just realized that I never actually added the simple material to my object. There we go. Now let's render it. And that one looks pretty overblown. Let's see. So this is the complex and this is the um, simple. You know, I wonder, let's uh, take a look at my layers. Yeah, I've been rendering with all three lighting setups. So um, let's turn off A and C. <laughs> yeah, and um, let's just render B by itself. Yeah, that's much better. So here it is with a simplistic shader. Here's the complex shader. I'll go back and forth between those a couple times. And uh, the first thing that strikes me is with the complex shader, once you break down the skin color into multiple layers, it uh, becomes a little bit more of a job to recombine those layers through the shader so that it looks um, realistic and natural. So I would want to spend a lot more time tweaking those colors because uh, with the simplistic, it looks like a more believable flesh tone. And then with the complex, you know, it looks like uh, his lips are very purple and like he's really, really cold or something. So um, that definitely needs some work. Also, the subsurface scale is a little bit too large with the complex shader, I think. But um, in general, you know, I think I'm fairly happy with it, um, at least for demonstrational purposes. One of the more important things to notice about this is uh, with the simplistic shader, we're at 2 minutes and 24 seconds. And then with the complex shader, we're at 3 minutes and 36 seconds. So that's a fairly substantial render time increase. And remember that um, this is the actual resolution at 50%. So you can imagine that once we um, enlarge the render resolution, that the render time will increase. And the extra render time with the complex shader will start to add up. So that's something to certainly keep in mind. But also don't forget that the purpose for the complex skin shader is you have a lot more control to really finely tune your subsurface skin shading to be exactly what you want. And that's going to be all for this tutorial. I hope through these lessons you have a much better idea of how to tackle realistic skin with the Cycles Render Engine. And I hope I've explained well enough the features of the uh, simple subsurface shading node as well as the complex skin shader from Matthew Heimlich so that um, you can tackle any skin shading task you can imagine. Thanks for watching.